Here, when I find out about Dad's army, meet me behind Jones's van. Don't tell nobody. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Hitler? If you think we're on the run. We are the boys who will stop your little game. We are the boys who will make you think again. Cause who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Hitler? If you think old England Dad's Army is the most affectionately regarded comedy programme in the history of television. So we're on a quest to find out just why it's so wonderful, which is really any excuse for me to drive Jones's van. Now, I have to warn you, this could be the only documentary made entirely in second gear. We're sitting in my office with a stack of Dad's Army videos and a cup of tea, and I've watched 40 programmes, and I think I know now what makes it so wonderful. I'm going to go to fourth gear now. Yes! Bob, it's on. Dad's arm is on. Don't panic! Don't panic! It is still popular. I mean, people really do love it. It was d definitely one of those shows where it was a family event. Excuse me, Uncle Sergeant. I was part of something which was going to be important in the, in the history of television. Stupid boy. When comedy really, really works well, you know, the, the, the secret ingredient is magic. It was a miracle. The cast was right. The time was right, the script was right, the tunes were right, and the whole situation was right. It's as simple as that. Don't let me be the to the German when our victory is ultimately won. Dad's army ran from 1968 to 1977. That's nine years. The Second World War was only six, and that's never been repeated. Like all good sitcoms, it's based on a very simple idea. The country blokes in the church all defending their country. Oh, no panic, got there. But of course it's much more than that. It's about a vanished England, it's about class, it's about relationships, it's about war. And although it's an ensemble piece, to me, the linchpin of the whole thing is the relationship of the two main characters, Mannering and Wilson, and those fantastic performances of John the Measure and Arthur Lowe. Stupid boy. Both went to public schools, didn't you? No, I... <laughs> I have a feeling, sir, you've got a little bit of a chip on your shoulder about that. There's no chip on my shoulder, Wilson. I'll tell you what there is on my shoulder, though. Three pips, and don't you forget it. Captain Mannering loved being in charge of the platoon. He made himself in charge of it, really. And um, when it all started, of course, everybody was volunteering for everything, and he decided to volunteer to himself to become a captain. <laughs> now, the first thing to do is to appoint a properly appointed commander. For what, sir? Appoint a properly appointed commander. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right? All right. People always say, was Arthur Lowe really pompous? Well, no, he wasn't, but he didn't suffer fools gladly. Mannering was the best example of pomposity ever. I don't think I gave you permission to sit, did I? <laughs> <laughs> he did get a bit carried away with... Um, his own importance, or own sense of importance, you know, and that he could fight the Germans single-handed. You, 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 you kind of have an empathy for, and you do feel for him. And at the end of the day, there were plenty of episodes where he showed himself to be a, a truly good person as well. We very rarely get a chance to meet on it as equals. No, we don't. However, tonight you may call me George. Oh, thanks, officer. <laughs> <laughs> and I should call you Arthur. Oh, will you really? Oh, good. <laughs> The change of Arthur Lowe as the aggressive captain, and he has from time to time to speak to his wife on the telephone, and he said, Get them to do so and so and so and so and so, and, so. and the complete change. Saying, Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. 
<laughs> Take a long time to answer, dear. Where have you been? <laughs> Voicing you. <laughs> She's been down in the air raid shelter. Oh. <laughs> I might have a little surprise for you tonight. <laughs> no, no, I, I was <laughs> David and Jimmy wanted her to appear in an episode, and Arthur wouldn't have it. No, 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 no. And I quite agree, because it was, oh, Elizabeth, oh, you know, she's indoors, and we all got this different idea of what Elizabeth was like. I think the only time we, we, we had a, a possible glimpse of, of, of her body was when her, her, her great big bum was... was in, uh, was in, in the top bunk, and Arthur was underneath, you know, Manning was underneath. You wake, Elizabeth. <laughs> Stuck on the bottom bunk of a joyless marriage with the unseen Elizabeth, no wonder Captain Mannering was tempted elsewhere. Oh, I shouldn't have eaten all that cheese. <laughs> Far too rich. <laughs> It's only Mannering that doesn't have anybody except his wife that's never seen until this one episode where Miss Fiona comes into his life. It was out of character for, for Mannering to drop his guard, if you'll pardon the pun, and, and go chasing off after Carmen's character. But it, it just showed an, another side, another facet of his character. Captain Mannering? Yes? Oh, I heard you were needing women helpers for the home guard. Is that yes. right? Yes, that is quite correct. I played a, a character called Fiona Grain, who'd um, gone down to Warmington-on-Sea to take her mother away from the bombs in London, and he absolutely falls for her. Fiona? A pretty name. Oh. <laughs> you think so? Yes, it's always been one of my favourites. Oh, thank you. <laughs> she says, would you mind taking your glasses off? Because I do feel it, it gets in the way of the warmth of one's eyes, and he sort of blossoms. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sweet that he grows and, and just wishes he didn't need the glasses. <laughs> She realises that he has a wife, so she decides to go back to London. Stand clear, sir. And pull those blinds down. Promise you'll promise you write. Very good. I promise. Make it so. Goodbye, George. I would say something like the brief encounter thing actually was not out of character for Mannering. It added a new dimension to his character. And this was the other wonderful thing that happened in so many episodes. You suddenly found a facet of a well-loved character that you hadn't seen before. You've got to, it's like, you know, you've got to have light and shade, really, um, for, for, for the comedy to work, you know. So, if it's gag, 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 it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. You've got to have that, you know. Not tears of the clown, you know, crying on the inside and all that. But uh, it's, you, you've got to get the balance, you've got to strike the balance for the comedy to work. Blow the bugle and bang the drum, go rum, tiddly, dum, 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 It's a wonderfully complicated relationship between Mannering and Wilson, because Wilson is sort of so effortlessly upper class and a lovely way with the ladies. Mannering, terribly unsure of himself, affects to despise the upper classes, but really maybe would like to be part of it. And, of course, the other complication is that Wilson is only the chief clerk of the Swallow Bank, Warmington on Sea, and Mannering is the bank manager. You're absolutely right. I'm still the manager and you're the chief clerk. Right. I'm still the officer and you are still the sergeant, right? So put your socks up and get about your business That's at the bank. That's right, sir. Well, the relationship between Captain Mannering and Wilson in the bank was a very strange one because the manager in those days was God. John the Measurer's character obviously came from, uh, you know, a very good family, upper class, and, uh, and Arthur was uh, made good from the ranks. Being a member of the aristocracy explains quite a lot about your character. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Wilson didn't give a sod, and this worried Captain Manning. <laughs> Wilson. <laughs> Wilson. 
What are you doing? I'm so sorry, sir, but uh, I thought as it was such a beautiful day, I thought while you were chatting away over there, <laughs> I'd take advantage of this glorious sun and try and get myself a little bit of a tan. <laughs> there was no way that Wilson would possibly want to run the Home Guard. Not at all. In fact, it was only really there because uh, Mannering told him to be. He was actually in control, really. He was more in control of a man than, than Mannering was, really. Are we to call the sergeant the Honourable Sergeant Wilson or Sergeant the Honourable Wilson? <laughs> I don't want any fuss. I just want to be like an ordinary sergeant. I'm sure that would suit us all, Wilson. <laughs> John Measure was wished on me by Michael Mills, who was then the head of comedy. His remark was, he said, you must have John LeMessurier, he suffers so beautifully. Sometimes you'd see him do that before he, before he answered, or while he was, was answering uh, in, in some mild sort of, you know, Mannering would have a go at him about something, and he'd say, yes, I, right, right, sir. It gets wise, and he'd wait. Till that's the prize. And I realised that he was waiting for that light on the camera. It gave it this wonderful vagueness, uh, which was very important to the show, and uh, we, we took advantage of that a lot. Now, listen, Arthur. Yes. You're going to tell Captain Mannering that I'm not having Frank going on any more route marches. Well, I can't possibly do that. Well, if you don't, and Frank wakes up in the night again, you won't be there to hear it. <laughs> We knew that he was carrying on this long-standing affair with Pike's mother, but we never mentioned anything. And she used to say, oh, Arthur, he's a, he's a wonderful man, you know. Oh, he's so strong. And we used to put in all these little innuendos. Could it be round later, Arthur, for your usual? Maybe. <laughs> the clever part of the writing was that it wasn't a, 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 a sort of classy lady. Uh, which you'd expect because Wilson was supposed to have come from that sort of class. But here was a, a lady who was a very ordinary, almost working class lady. Uh, duck, gin and tonic, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> and don't get all Nelly Dean out you did last week. <laughs> Excuse me, mate. Oh, God blimey, how'd you do that? <laughs> Uncles and aunts and those sort of things so, um, were part of people's lives and it, it did keep things moving very smoothly in, in, in family circles. And unquestioned, it was uncle. Yeah, well, what I can't understand is, I never hear you leave and I never hear you come back in the morning. <laughs> yes, well, I, you see, I, I let myself in and out very quietly. <laughs> you never do anything else quietly. After we'd finished, I, th I in fact said to David, David, was, was John my father? He said, oh, of course he was, yes. Come on, Frank. I'm going to have this out with Captain Manor in here and now. My mother is such a fool. I can't help that. Evening. Yeah, Pike was based probably on me and the rest of us boys that were in the home guard. <laughs> Uncle Arthur. Yes? I've got an idea. I'm delighted. <laughs> Jimmy very kindly told me after about ten episodes that Pike was him, which, <laughs> thanks, Jim, um, <laughs> suddenly you told that you were playing the writer. Uh, it, it was Jimmy in that he was this, that age in the war and he was in the Home Guard. What do you want now, Pike? Uh, I'm sorry to disturb you again, Mr Mannering, but mm. Mrs Mannering's on the phone again. Oh. Look, I told her you were having coffee with Mrs Fox, but she insists on... <laughs> Stupid boy. <laughs> I suppose he was the main foil for nearly every uh, every ambition that, that Mannering had. Why don't we wrap something round the pipe to stop the flow? Yes, that's a good idea. Right, right, right. Take off your tunic and wrap it on the pipe. Why me? Because you're wet already. Oh, I'm I'm right. Arthur came to me one day in the rehearsal room and said, Ian, don't worry about her not having a lot of lines. They'll come. In the meantime, he said, get yourself a funny costume and stand near me. Pipe. You must not wear a coloured scarf with your uniform. How many times do I have to tell you? Take that off at once. Oh, my mum says I mustn't take it off, I'll get croup. <laughs> when Britain is in danger, when trouble's in the air, we all forget our squabbles, it's trespassers beware. The nation is united when danger looms in sight. 
We march along together. Now, the world of Warmington on the Sea is pre war because even in the middle of the war, things were pre war because they didn't have time to be post war until after the war because there was a war on. So, the society that Mannering was a pillar of is a very rigid one. You've got the town clerk, the rotary club, the golf club. No wonder nobody could stand hodges. You've done your flipping greengrocer. United we shall stand, whatever may befall the richness. There's a wonderful variety of ages within the main group. You've got the Spiv Walker, who's old enough to fight and has obviously fiddled his way out of it. You've got a stupid boy, Pike, who's too young to fight, well, he's too young to be out of an evening, according to his mother. And then there's Jonesy, Clive Dunn, who joined the army in 1880-something, gave the fuzzy was a good scene to, and is prepared to do the same to the Jerry. It's the taste of the cold steel. They don't like it up them, you know. I've just been struck by something deadly. <laughs> so I, I look at it this way. We're now all put in possession of highly secret information. Now, supposing he was captured by an enemy agent, sir, how long could we stand out against torture before we revealed ourselves? I spent four years in a prisoner of war camp, you see, working for Hitler, of course, and um, up a mountainside digging and God knows what else. So, when I had this part, uh, I mean, it was like a sort of revenge for me. I could say, mm -hmm, I could be aggressive. And it, was, it was like a wonderful, happy revenge. For that. I signed on as a drummer boy in 1884. Later, saw service in the Sudan, fought the Fuzzy Wuzzies. Fuzzy Wuzzies, they were the boys. They come at you with a great long knife and zip you right open. <laughs> <laughs> I soon find out if you've got any guts or not. The part of Corporal Jones was based on a real life character, an old soldier that had been with me in the Home Guard. They don't like the cold steel, you see, sir. They don't like it up them, you see, sir. They don't, they don't like the. Get him a chair. <laughs> this instructor we had, a regular soldier, probably 30 years, been in the 1480 war, he used to say, I've got to bane it. You've got to understand the cold steel. They don't like it up them. They do not like it up them. They can't abide the cold steel. So show them the cold steel. And you think, well, who wants it up? When I saw it in the script, they don't like it up them, I, I thought, that's a bit offensive. And I thought, <clears throat> Well, what would an old butcher who'd been in all those campaigns, he would, he would say that, you know, I mean, he, he would say they don't like it up them. There's no substitute for the cold steel. They do not like it up them. They don't like it up them. <laughs> I might have mentioned that to you before. Well, the British love that sort of humour, don't they? So I gave it the full works. They don't like it up, I'm sir. Grab him, Pike. Oh, oh. Uh, you do that again, you get this up, you, and you will not like it. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that, that I got what I, we used to call Joey Joey's. The Joey Joey's were the, really a sh short term for the obvious gag. Like the red hot poker up the bum. Two, a ten, cut! <laughs> Captain Manning was very frustrated by Jones, although he, he admired him in a way, but um, he, he was s such a silly man and making silly suggestions. Any suggestions? Mr. Speaker, sir. Yeah. What well, about the tunnel, sir? Tunnel. Tum. Yes, sir. See, we can all go round behind that wall and we can dig a hole in a downward direction, sir. <laughs> <laughs> down and down and down, then suddenly we start digging sideways, so sideways, sideways. Then when we think round to the mill, start digging upwards, upwards, upwards. <laughs> and God willing, we'll be in the mill. <laughs> or else in Australia. <laughs> uh, I think you're in the realms of fantasy again here, Jim. <laughs> it was a, a time of great hardship, um, and, and yet, uh, you know, there were the, 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 it, it was in, it, it, it showed how resourceful people are in those times. Um, and that hardship was obviously, a, it, it, it was um, great raw material for comedy with um, you know, Corporal Jones being able to do sausages for people. You got any sausages? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> when war's on, butchers are the kings of the area, you know, everybody can make, keep, keep going nicely with the butcher, you know. And uh, Jack Jones sort of, uh, sort of uh, rather enjoyed that situation, I think. I've bought that for you. Oh, what's this? Your favourite tobacco. Oh, thank you very much, madam. And I'll be in later in the week. <laughs> <laughs>
he was quite sort of romantic in a way, and he, he was mad about Mrs. Fox, you know, played, played by Pamela Cundell so deliciously. Well, she was um, a flirt. There's no getting away from it. I mean, she, she made a play for Mr. Jones, the butcher, because she wanted sausages and she wanted kidneys. I'm only a humble butcher, you know. Is it true affection she feels for me? Does she love me for myself? Or does she love me for my meat? <laughs> <laughs> they decided, Jimmy and uh, David, that we should get married. So that was the lucky for me, because it was a lovely episode. Oh, it was gorgeous. No confetti! No confetti! I'm going to throw confetti, so y'all and sucks to you. It's not only Jonesy who has some wonderful one-liners. The whole show's full of them. We first became aware that it was becoming very popular when people shout, you know, workmen up on a roof, say, Oi, Jonesy! Hey, don't like it up on the whole shot. Don't panic, you know. Don't panic! <laughs> stupid boy. But Mr. Spitzer, he's doomed, doomed! <laughs> you stupid boy. We never thought of catchphrases as such. Oh, we'll put these in and they'll catch on. They just happened. <laughs> <laughs> you stupid boy. Certain things sort of crept in. Um, and the public picked them up, really. Oh, all wet, Mr. Manning! <laughs> Stupid boy. <laughs> See, the fact is, they do not like it up them. <laughs> they can't stand it, you see. They really can't. It's hard to analyse a catchphrase uh, and decide whether it's uh, intrinsically funny out of context, because what we know of those catchphrases is... Uh, uh, is people repeating themselves now in, in the light of it having been on Dad's army for however many years. So when someone says, um, don't panic or stupid boy, um, it, it, it's loaded with all the, all, all, all the kind of comedy baggage of, of, of being in a very, very successful sitcom. Number, please. Uh, Warming's on C. <coughs> I've forgotten the number. You stupid boy. <laughs> it's Warming's on C. Just a moment. <laughs> All the main characters have the thing that they do, which is the thing that the original audience would have really latched on to, like phrases, rolling eye, Jonesy doing his drill a beat after everybody else, Godfrey always wanted to be excused. But they actually all do many, many more things than that, which is why I think you can watch the programmes a lot and they don't pull. John! John! <laughs> wasn't awfully good, was it? We used to start, I think, every programme virtually with a line-up because um, it just, it, it's a useful way of introducing everybody. What's, what's in your pockets, Walker? Well, that's a pound of granulated and that's a pound of sultanas. <laughs> I really must check this sort of thing, you know, before I inspect the troops. It's, it's disgraceful, Walker, absolutely disgraceful. If you do that kind of thing again, you'll just have to throw it into the dustbin. Well, it makes no odds to me. I mean, you've paid for them. <laughs> Jimmy Beck's character, Private Walker, I think they, they were called spivs in those days. He was the one that, that could get you anything. He could get you your nylons or lipstick or whatever. He was able to make a few bob out of the war, as, as, as people were then. But it was still part of that community. He wasn't selling... Uh, Walker wasn't selling something, you know, huge to, to a, an outside sort of a country or something. It was all done within that... that that little framework. He always got the girl, but of course you see the character is going to say he did. So it's up to you to make up your mind whether he did. Um, he was the only one who could get the girl, <laughs> let's face it. <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Mannering, Edith Parrish. Miss Parrish? Have you an occupation, Miss Parrish? Yes, I'm an usherette. That's My character in Dad's Army was Private Walker's girlfriend. She wasn't exactly a good time girl, but she liked a bit of fun. <laughs> there was never anything of, of any uh, sexual thing at all. That, that would be uh, totally wrong. Now, we all know that the Second World War brought out the best in us. We had brilliant teeth, we could make a pretty good sponge cake from two carrots and a hairnet, and we could do all the actions from underneath the spreading chestnut tree. But while Dad's Army is about that war, what adds an extra layer to it, I think, is that you're watching people who actually fought in that war. 
And as a setting for a comedy programme, War is brilliant because you don't have to have any really nasty characters because you've got the biggest baddie in the world, the one that you're all united to fight against, Hitler. And, of course, he's Nazis. Who hold the platoon captive by putting a bomb down Corporal Jones's trousers in the famous episode, The Deadly Attachment. Right, so look, there's a colonel. But, of course, the original story is that it was going to go around Arthur Lowe's trousers. And it wasn't until we were actually in this setup, setting up, in the street, he said, I've just read the script. I have to have a bomb in my trousers. He wouldn't have it. I don't know why he didn't have it. Anyway, they decided to put it down my trousers. One of the cleverest rewrites I've ever come across in my life, Dave and Jimmy said, we've got the rewrites. They had it in the script, and they just crossed out Mannering and put Jones. <laughs> so, so he's hoisted his own but I had to go along with him. I was very, very happy. I was always happy to have a bomb put down my trousers. <laughs> Save yourself! Hang on, Charles, cut it out! No! <laughs> <laughs> I think it should have gone off by now. So it should. I've been saved. I've been saved! He was very strange about what he would and would not do in terms of comedy. I mean, apparently he had an agreement with David Croft when he started to arrange what he was going to do in the show. He wouldn't, wouldn't do any scenes where he had to remove his trousers. Now that the crisis is past, do you mind asking Fraser to take his hand out of my trousers? <laughs> That's the nearest approach to pornography ever got in the programme, I think. <laughs> the Deadly Attachment was, a, was a very much a favourite episode with us. Uh, it was... Um, I suppose when you get a, a really, really strong situation and a crisis like that, it's, uh, it's very easy to play it through. This captain here. Oh, yeah. This surly brute. Watch him. I play the U-boat commander. Uh, myself and my crew had been captured, and um, it, they found out immediately, early on in the program, that Dad's army have to look after us until the official army arrive the next day. I'm warning you, Captain. Just do as you're told. <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't easy to um, br bring the platoon face to face with the Germans because, uh, in reality, they never were virtually. So we couldn't use that very often. But uh, when we could, we reveled in it really. I am making notes, Captain. And your name will go on the list. <laughs> and when we win the war, you will be brought to account. You're right, what you like. You're not going to win this war. Oh, yes, we are. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, we are. <laughs> Whistle while you work. Hitler is at work. He's half army, so's his army. Whistle while you work. Your name will also go on the list. <laughs> what is it? Don't tell him, Pike. Pike. <laughs> we knew we got a funny moment there. And this was one line, one episode, that went out once. And the next day, in the street, people shouted across, don't tell him, Pike. You know, that was quite extraordinary. This is Warmington on Sea. All right, it isn't, there's no such place. I know that, I work in television. But this is Thetford, where the Dad's Army team came for two weeks every year to do all their location filming for the whole series. And I can't show you Stead and Simpson or Timothy White's or the Novelty Rock Emporium closed for the duration. But if you think about it, Warmington on Sea wouldn't have those places now either. I'm gone, I'm gone, I'm hooked. There's still an Undertaker's and a Butcher's. Is there a bank still? Hey, Pikey would be about 70 now. He could be walking up and down here, ordering kebab and chips, nipping into the Sue Ryder shop. He's not real, stupid boy. Hey, here's a tip. If you want your comedy show to be watched and enjoyed 30 years after it was written, set it in the past. Then it's already dated and it can't date. Which I thought of that. Mr Manlin, it went to the judder and tore me trousers off. <laughs> Are you all right? I've lost... That which I hold most dear. <laughs> <laughs> the pocketbook and discharge papers. 
I remember Thetford well because we went there year after year. He's only lost his trousers. And the people were pleased to see you, you know, and the pubs around and the typical English town, really. I mean, we liked it. Uh, Arthur Lowe used to come up by coach. He, he liked to come up by coach, you see. He could lord it a bit sitting in the coach. And, and very nice, you know, the countryside, be pleasant, you have to drive all this sort of thing, and working out if they'd got the message at the tobacconist for his special fags, you see, when he got up there, all that would go on, you know. Uh, never mind about what we were going to do filming, that was, you know, that was another world. I used to drive up with um, John Le Measure, mostly, he's my mate. And the Bell Hotel, I mean, there was plenty of booze in the boat, and we all met at mealtime. It was an extraordinary situation, really, it was quite good fun. Jimmy and David always had the most extraordinary luck with, with the weather. I mean, people used to say, well, if you're planning your summer holidays in England, do it at the time when Dad's army's on location, because they always get marvellous weather. It's like being allowed into a gentleman's exclusive club, because they were all absolute sweethearts in their own way. We worked very hard during the day's filmings. I mean, there's no question about that. We'd get up, uh, we'd go down to breakfast. Arthur would probably complain about the kippers or something. We got to, I think I had a little ham this morning. This is off the boom, he said to the waiter, it's off the boom. And Clive wandering about looking for his boots. I didn't know somebody put my boots on my denim bed there. Anybody go here? It's probably in your room, Clive. Bet you go down there, go and have a look. Some of them were distinctly sort of middle-aged and over, and uh, the wives came to look after them and, uh, and <laughs> would have a break in the morning, tea, coffee, whatever, and they'd, they'd, the wives would be fussing around. I mean, this was a film in itself. I tell you, Arnold Ridley was the funniest to me. His wife, she used to dry him to Thetford and things like that, you know. And she used to have to go and get the food from the, you know, the wagon. And uh, she, he did boss her about a lot. I think I'd say, darling, you sit there and I'd get a cup of tea now. And they'd go, yes, dear. I said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Doffy, uh, can I have your assistance, sir? Look your front. <laughs> and don't wear your hat straight on your head like that. Look like George Formby. <laughs> Private Godfrey was a wonderful invention. Uh, oh, would you mind holding that, sir? And perfectly cast with Arnold Ridley, because he was so gentle and sweet. Godfrey! <laughs> Did someone call? <laughs> Godfrey, he was the nurse, wasn't he? Well, if there was anyone in need of medical attention, it was probably him. But, of course, we got enormous comedy out of uh, the way they all had to help him into the van and things like that, that... Um, all his disabilities were, were, were an enormous advantage from a comedy point of view. Did he ever do anything? Did he? Because he always had his, you know, Red Cross box on. I don't think he ever owned it. Did he? <laughs> Did he? Jones has got a bout of malaria. Have we got anything we can give him? I don't know. Oh, oh yes, sir. I've got, I've got some aspirin and yeah. uh, carbonate of soda. Uh, yeah, and some ointment for wasp stings. Wasp stings? <laughs> This is a fighting unit, not a girl guides out in. <laughs> One of us was wounded. I said, Arnold, you know, are you up to this? I think he was about 73 or 4 at the time. Uh, you know, because I don't think I can, I can protect you from actually having to run occasionally. And, and you know, are you up to it? And he said, oh, yes, I think so. Yes, I think I'll manage. We made a rush across the field with fixed bayonets or whatever we do running. It was quite sort of hard, but it did quite a lot. He used to let Arnold Ridley off, and that annoyed John Lurie, because I think they were more or less the same age. I can't be absolutely sure. While we're rushing here in the air and running the flag up the pole, old Godfrey will still be trying to climb out of the van. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. They were genuinely out of breath from time to time. And, um, you know, it, 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 again, it, it added to the pathos of the fact that uh, poor old levels, they, uh, they were trying to keep up, as it were, trying to do it. This one isn't very good for the heart. They found the biggest rods of their life when they thought their careers had finished, because they're all pushing it a bit. Well done. Don't give up. And they thought they were sort of curtains for them, and suddenly they had this terrific new lease of life. Mannering. They're going to leave with his senses. John Laurie who was then in his mid-70s, had worked at the old Vic with 
Gilgood, Olivier and all the greats and was a fine classical actor. He'd tell you it was the greatest King Lear that they ever had there, you know, he was a very modest fellow. This is Private Fraser. Uh, howdy. News the day and news the hour. See the front of battle lure. And see a proud Hitler's London tour, thieves and slavery. War would be a title day. <laughs> War said bases be a slave. War would fill a coward's grave. <laughs> like turn and flee. <laughs> I can remember his once uh, saying to um, to Jimmy Perry, you know, Jimmy, I, uh, I played all the great Shakespearean roles at Stratford between the wars, and now I've become a household name doing this rubbish of yours. He said, Jimmy Perry, ah, I, just, I think this is a load of rubbish. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a mere check at the end of the week, but uh, I don't think there's any chance of it being a success. Mark my words. Well, you know, and then when it was, of course, then went up to Jimmy and... and after the secretary, of course, I never had any doubt it would be a success. Great, great laddie, great. Captain Monterey, <laughs> did, did he ever hear the story uh, of the old empty barn? <laughs> no. Would he like to hear the story of the old empty barn? I just used to dish up all that stuff. We do, do. He was doing that in Will Hay films 40 years before him. The story of the old <laughs> empty barn. <laughs> well, there was nothing in it. <laughs> There's something about the soldier, something about the soldier, something about the soldier that is fine. It did them an awful lot of good because, uh, as far as the cast were concerned, they were all getting on, you know, quite old. And uh, I think it did them a lot of good to sort of wave them about in the fresh air every spring. <laughs> and we had enormous fun. We were all let off the leash at night and wandering about the pubs, you know, bumping into one another. And the ones that pretended they didn't drink You'd see them looking a bit furtive. <laughs> you got to know the cast. And we'd all go down to the bar, and Arthur would be on the stool, immaculately dressed, slightly red in the face, and with what he called an Amazon, which was a gin with ginger ale and one, not two, one slice of cucumber in it. And he'd be propped up against the bar, well, and we'd all drift in, I don't know why we all dressed up. We did. And we'd yarn. I remember Arthur saying to David Croft one day about me, he said, mm, where'd you get this fella from? And David said, well, he's been in variety. I said, mm, really? Mm. <laughs> As if, you know. Why did you pick on someone your own size? Come on, try having a go at me. Come on, come on. Oh, Hold my glasses, oh, Wilson. I think I was a bit of an outsider to start with. <laughs> Don't you tangle with him in your crippled state. I'd do it for you, sir. I was as if I was somebody looking in. That was the strange feeling I had, looking into this group of, of, of seven, you know. Bill Pertley, bless his heart, um, who played Hodges, he was a sort of villain of the piece. I became sort of Mannering's private Hitler. I suppose it was with great pleasure that the writers wrote, if there's any, any water around, that he would get it. <laughs> I took the brunt of a few of the stunts. <laughs> <you niggas! laughs> um, he was terribly good-natured about it. Oh, here we go again! <laughs> One of the uh, situations was was a bit alarming. There's an object coming out of the waters. Oh, good, good. Won't be long now. When we were doing a late-night filming at Low Stuffed, about two o'clock in the morning, and the boat I was in overturned with me, and the water got underneath my the strap of my helmet. <laughs> By the time I came out, and I was all right, you know, I just sort of gurgled a bit and spat a bit of water out. Um, everybody had gone. There was only one person left. They'd all gone to the next, to the next shot. So I was somewhere else. And I said, where is everybody? They said, we're gone. And it might about me out of the boat. And then we couldn't chuck him in the water anymore because we were filming in rivers and there were rats in them. The health and safety don't like comedy, as far as I can see. Um, and... Um, 
But in those days, if you wanted to chuck somebody in a river, you could do so, and usually it was Bill. But as long as I got the check at the end of the week. <laughs> the very thought of you and I forget to do... That summer, the show reached its highest viewing figures yet. Firmly established as a hit comedy, it seemed the platoon was unstoppable. Was the first person to die amongst this old cast, unfortunately, was Jimmy Beck, and uh, that was a great shock to us all. He became ill with one indication, actually, and I think uh, he was hovering for about, f about a fortnight or uh, at death's door, as it were. Jimmy dying so young, at 39, presented a lot of difficulties. There's no way will we have recast that part. And I'm afraid he was a very, very heavy drinker. It just got him in the end. The next episode, when it was obvious Jimmy was not going to be in it, um, in that last episode of the series, um, it's very sad, very poignant. Um, the camera goes along the line and comes to a gap. And there's a note where he would have been standing. Captain Mannering. Personal. Oh, personal. Yeah, give it to me. Oh. <laughs> Unusual perfume. <laughs> Petrol. <clears throat> Dear Cap. <laughs> Thanks for letting me off. Had to go up to, up to the spoke for a few days to do a deal. I think I... It was a shock. And, of course, in, from a selfish point of view, we thought, my God, what's going to happen to the programme? Are we still going to be able to do it? So it was, uh, it was awful for his wife and, and for all his friends. It was a bad time, a bad time. Mm. Yeah, something went, most certainly, um, despite the success of what the four or five series that we did without you after. But there's something wasn't there. There's no doubt about that. Just the thought of you, the very thought of you, my love. So there was an effort made to replace Jimmy. It was an impossible task. I mean, you, could, you couldn't take over from, um, from somebody like him. In the next series, a lovely Welsh actor called Telvrin Thomas, a teach like that, Mr Cheeseman. He was on the local newspaper, the Warmington Bugle. And he was war correspondent, and he had a, a, a arm man with WC on the side. What's there? Oh, that? Oh, that, that so as everyone knows what I do. <laughs> what do you do? Well, WC, war correspondent. <laughs> John Loy came to me once and he said, James, can I have a word, please? He said, is young Welsh fella going to be in the next series? I said, uh, I don't know. He said, well, make sure he isn't. He's getting far too many laughs. <laughs> totally ruthless. <laughs> and Talvrin was not in the next year, and he was so funny. So very, very funny. 30 years on, the show remains as fresh as ever. But inevitably, many of that wonderful cast are no longer with us. I think it's, it's rather sad that Arthur and John and some of the other actors never lived to see the extent of the full fame that Dad's army reached. I never mind watching it when I turn it on, my, and, uh, and actually my children like it. My, my two oldest children are seven and five and a half, and they find it funny, which is uh, great. I think one of the things that they like about it is, is it's grown-ups being silly and trying to be serious, you know, and, 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 and sort of coming undone as a result, and they, they enjoy that side of it. I met a little boy the other day in, in, in a shop, and his daddy said, Mrs Fox, and I said, can you can meet my son? So uh, he came up, oh, we shook hands. So we had a little talk, and I said to him, I said, now, why do you like Dad's army? And he said, because it's funny and not rude. Now, out of the mouths of babes, it was absolutely wonderful. What do you think of this? <laughs> oh, it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
<laughs> no, 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 no. It's awfully good. Awfully good. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> What's it, Wilson? <laughs> you might snap your girdle. <laughs> But a few years ago, I was at a charity event at St James's Palace, and I was introduced to the Queen Mother. And she likes people to stand in a semicircle. She doesn't like straight lines. And I said to her, I do believe, Mom, that I was in a program which is a favourite of yours. And she said, what's that? I said, Dad's Army. And she went, oh, yes. And she addressed the whole ensemble all there. She said, you know what it's like when you've had a bad day and you come home and you put your feet up and you pop on a video and there you are laughing again I think there is a nostalgic thing about dad's army which people value and, they, and it is looking back on something which one sort of in a way longs for, not the horrors of war, but the feeling of community, the feeling of belonging to one another, and I think that's important. The British public behaved very well at that particular time, and uh, we uh, took advantage of that, and I think that's one of the appeals of the programme. It showed the spirit, which sadly is lacking today, that people had about pulling together and keeping our country safe. That is an aspect of it, but I, d I don't relate to that at all. I mean, uh, I had, like a lot of people, a foul war and um, wouldn't want to go back to that, no. Sixty years since the real Dad's Army, the Home Guard, was formed to defend our shores. Thirty years since Arthur Lowe and John Le Measure went into the studio to record the first episode. It's two different lifetimes away, but we're still watching them. Mannering struggling to maintain his dignity, Wilson very rarely losing his, Godfrey just having to be excused for a moment, and all the other brave soldiers marching breathlessly across yet another field to make us laugh again and again and again. There are some wonderful comedy shows around now. I don't think all old comedy is good, but what I think Dad's Army has got, which is quite a rarity in entertainment now, is that it's celebratory and it's positive and it's innocent. It's got some fantastically wonderful performances and it's, oh, whatever the opposite of a one-note samba is, it's just full of wit, pathos, character, slapstick farce, overplaying, underplaying. It's stuffed full. It's, it's like a draft excluder. What? Well, look, you know what I mean. <laughs> Young and beautiful, it's your duty to be beautiful. Keep young and beautiful if you want to be loved. Stick together, you can rely on that. If anybody tries to take our homes or our freedom away from us, they'll find out what we can do. We'll fight. And we're not alone, there are thousands of us all over England. And Scotland. And Scotland. <laughs> all over Great Britain, in fact. Men who will stand together when their country needs them. Excuse me, sir, don't you think it might be a nice idea if we were to pay our tribute to them? For once, Wilson, I agree with you. <laughs> to Britain's Home Guard. To Britain's Home, home Guard. guard. He's with the friend, come. The is wounding to our pride. Last night we saw the cutest little German parachutist who looked like kit, giggled a bit, and laughed until he cried. We'll have to hide that armored car, we're marching to Berlin. We'll almost be ashamed of it in Rome. So if you've got to fight us with the friend, 